this web app i have showed how we can create the app service web app using a web app plan and then how to create an app service web app and then what kind of uh, applications we can deploy into this app service web app now the next service is container instances so container instances is the is a simple service that allows us to deploy containerized applications in a serverless mode what is mean by serverless if I don't want to create the infrastructure explicitly. Means I don't want to provision any infrastructure for creating this containerized applications. Then we can say it is a managed serverless service. So this is one of the fastest and simplest way of running a container in the Azure platform. Yes, we have some other services that also allows us to run the containerized application. So containerized application means the Docker container applications. Why we are calling this is very simple and fastest way of deploying the containers. Because there is no need to create any virtual machines explicitly and there is no need for any orchestration services like uh, kubernetes or dcos or docker swam or anything like that so you can simply specify the name of the image and the port configuration which port number to be open for accessing the application that's it. You will be able to create your container instance and you will be able to run your containerized application. See when to use this container instances. If you are planning to deploy an application on the cloud, we will think whether it is a lift and shift migration or it's a, we are deploying a cloud optimized application. If it is a lift and shift, then we will check whether it can be containerized or not. If yes, and we will check whether it require an orchestration or not. If no, then we can go and deploy in the app service web app. But the problem here is we have to create an app service plan, which means we have to allocate a compute and then deploy our containerized application. So I don't want to go and create a compute instance here. So what we can do, we'll go for or we will check whether uh, we need a full fledged orchestration service required means the AKS kind of orchestration is required or not for running this containers. If no, then we can simply choose container instances means we can run the containers very simply. OK. So that means if you are creating a new application or you are doing a migration the containerized applications we can run inside this container instances without provisioning any infrastructure without requiring any orchestration services it also allows us to run multiple containers as a group which is called a container group so container group is a logical grouping of 
multiple containers where uh, in some scenarios we may need to run two services together sometimes uh, we have to go and run maybe we have to go and run one application container so this could be your main application container and along with we have to run one background job so we have to run a main application container and a background job so this main application container is accessible from outside means you will be able to access the web application which is running inside this main application and this background job is just to make sure that some execution happens with uh, uh, the trigger or with the uh, main application suppose the main application wants to execute some background jobs we can run that with the help of another container or sometimes this can be a database service in this the main application could be a web application and this second container could be a database container and if the application is not running then there is no need for database and if the database is not there then there is no need for the application so that means there is a interdependency between these two so that's why we can run them inside same group container group so they will share the same container life cycle that means if the container group is crashed or deleted both the containers will go down okay so it's not like that one container will run and the other will not run if the container goes down both the containers will go down and if you are starting the container group both the containers start together that means they have the same life cycle second thing they can share a common storage so if i want to store some data persistently they can, like a log files okay so here i can store the logs so the background jobs container or database container and the web application container can share the same volume external storage volume because they are running inside the same container another thing they will be sharing the same ip address so the container groups will have a say ip so for example if the ip is 10.0.1.5 so if this is the ip okay means this is the private ip and if you are looking about the public ip then it will be something like uh, okay let me type the public ip this is the public ip of our uh, container group for accessing this web application i can use the port number 80 and if you want to access the database we can use a port number a different port number maybe the same ip like a 1433 so for connecting to the database we can use this ip and for connecting to the web app we can use this ip so you can see same ip but the port number is different so that means they will share the same network ip but using the port numbers we can access these applications separately okay so container group is a way of running multiple containers together inside the apps app 
container instances. But in most of the scenarios, we will run a single container. So this multiple container comes in rare scenarios, but most of the scenarios we will be running a single container inside the container instances. So we don't need to go for a container group. In case if you want to run more than one container together, then only you go for the container group. When to use this container instances? This container instances are very faster way to run the containers so that when we use the AKS cluster or when we create an AKS cluster, one minute, just a minute. <clears throat> Okay, so let's continue. Suppose if we have a Kubernetes cluster, so consider that this is our uh, Kubernetes we will discuss next. Suppose inside the Kubernetes cluster, we have multiple node. So this is node one, which means a virtual machine only. This is a node one, node two, and we have the node 3. That means there are three virtual machines or three nodes inside this AKS cluster. But the problem here is, the problem here is whenever I deploy my containerized applications inside this nodes, suppose if these are containerized applications, we can run multiple containers inside this. But every node has a limit that it can run maximum n number of containers. Suppose if suppose this node can run maximum three containers. Okay, so suppose if this is full, that means every node has reached its maximum capacity. Now, if I want to start a new container inside this cluster, if I want to start a new container or if I want to deploy a new container inside this cluster, it will be difficult because we have already reached the maximum capacity or maximum number of containers. If I want to add more containers, we need to first add a new machine. For example, we have to add a fourth instance. So this would be our fourth instance. Then only we will be able to deploy additional containers inside this. But creation of this new node will take some time because it's a virtual machine and this virtual machine creation will takes maybe a minute or two but what if i want to quickly start a new instance and because we know the number of requests coming to the application is higher that's the reason we are scaling out scaling out means we are creating new instances because the demand is so high. So creating a new VM and then deploying the containers inside it will take some time. So instead of creating a new VM or new node and then deploying the containers inside it, it's a 
easiest way to start a container instance. So here this could be your ACI that is Azure Container Instance and this will be considered as an extension of this particular cluster. So that means this is going to be considered as a extension of this and the new container can be started within this. And since we have already discussed creating a container instance does not require a VM allocation. We don't need to allocate the VM prior. It will dynamically allocate the VMs for execution and it is much faster than creating a VM because VM means it, we have to manually create a fresh new VM, but in ACI, it will be dynamically allocating an existing VM. So inside the data center, there are lots of VMs already running and it allocates any one of this compute to execute that one. So that means there is no need to create a new VM. It uh, dynamically allocates a new v, uh, allocates a VM to the ACI. So execution of a new container inside the ACI is very faster because we don't need to wait for the creation of a new virtual machine. So you can create multiple instances of this ACI and attach to this cluster. Suppose if I want to attach multiple containers or we have to run multiple containers, we can create new instance of ACI and add it to this. So this happens very quickly. So for faster scaling, for faster scaling, we can use ACI as an extension of our AKS cluster. So that is one use case of ACI. That is what here they are saying. So the benefits, one is it is fast and easy. Second is used for testing and development of containerized applications used for short lived process because they are we are not allocating any dedicated compute it's a dynamically allocated compute so for a simple execution maybe i want to execute a task and once that task is completed i can delete that instance so if i want to dynamically allocate and execute a task and after the task execution we can simply destroy that instance such cases we can go for ACI that means for short lived processes we can use the container instances and it can be used for AKS overflow overflow means when the AKS uh, nodes are completely full and we want to create new instances of containers instead of creating a new node and then deploying the containers we can create an ACI and attach to the AKS as a virtual node. So the virtual node is a concept that helps us to use ACI as an extension of AKS cluster. So uh, if you see the cons, it does not scale because one ACI is always running a single instance or single container only. It cannot scale explicitly, but if you uh, add it as a part of AKS, it will automatically spawn multiple instances. But if you consider a single instance, it cannot scale automatically because there is no scaling configurations there. So this is not designed for microservices, means this is not a good uh, service for running microservices based application for microservices we primarily use AKS clusters so containerized microservices we use AKS clusters but ACI is not uh, designed for microservices if we can compare the containers means docker containers with the virtual machines you can see the isolation if you consider as a feature 
containers are used for isolating the application that means it is not performing the hardware isolation it is performing the application isolation which means you will be containerizing the application code and its dependencies that can run independently inside a host machine but virtual machines it is a complete isolation which is uh, providing strong security boundary because in the host vm or host machine uh, you will be creating multiple uh, instance uh, sorry multiple virtual machines and each virtual machine has its own boundary mean because it's the hardware isolation Operate, operating system means inside the docker container we are using only the user mode portion of the operating system means it is not running a complete operating system it is just a kernel and shell will be running inside the uh, uh, container but in virtual machines we will be installing a complete operating system and deployment if you consider we will be deploying the containers using docker engine so docker engine is required to run the containers and for virtual machines we can run the virtual machines in cloud or on premise and we can deploy them using the azure portal cli or powershell or you can even use the arm templates or even automation tools automation uh, services persistent storage as i have drawn in the picture we can use external volumes to store the data that means we can use azure disk or file share for storing the data so container is a short lived instance anything that you store inside the container will lose its data or the container will lose its data once it restart or once it is crashed so <clears throat> so uh, if i want to persist the data which is uh, stored or which is uh, added by the container or any container data we want to store persistently then we have to use azure disk or file share kind of persistent volumes for virtual machines as i have mentioned in the virtual machine section you can have the os disk uh, or data disk uh, for persistent storage or even you can use the file share the azure file share can be mapped as a network drive for your virtual machines fault tolerance in containers if a cluster node fails any containers running on it are rapidly recreated by the orchestrator on another cluster node so this is applicable to aks if you say because in uh, aci there is no orchestrator involved but if you use aks kind of services whenever the uh, node fails node means the virtual machine which is part of your cluster suppose if this is if this is a node if this node fails it automatically create the containers which is running here you can see there are three containers so these three containers will be automatically created in inside another node okay so that means the orchestrator will automatically uh, start those containers in a, another Uh, node in virtual machines can fail over uh, to another server uh, virtual machines can fail over to another server in a cluster with the vm's operating system restarting on the new server so that means in case of virtual machines if the virtual machines operating system crashes or some infrastructure crashes it will restart with the another node 
means the disk will be attached to another uh, instance, another VM instance, and the VM can fail over to another server. Let me show you a container instance, how simple it is to run a container inside this. So for that, we need a containerized application. So I'll show you where I can get the containerized application. So I have some containers stored inside my Docker Hub account. So Docker Hub is a container registry. See here, I have one container containerized application, which is static web, a simple static web application. So I want to run this static web application inside my container inside container instance. For that, I can go to Azure portal, search for container instances. Create. See, it's very simple. You just need to select your uh, resource group, then container name. What should be the name of your application container? I can say static web only. Running in the East US location, that's fine. Availability is on. If you want, you can select. And my container is coming from which image source? I can choose some existing images which is provided by Microsoft or I can attach a registry container registry from Azure or some external registry external registry means here Docker Hub is an external registry. So I'll select other registry and select public because my image is a public image with the latest tag. And here I can specify how much CPU and memory required for running this application. I'm just leaving this as it is. Networking, I'm saying this is publicly accessible. And a DNS name label, optionally you can specify. So I can give something like a um, static web. Port number 80 is open by default. Here, no other features, just review and create. See here, it is creating a new container instance. Okay, it's now created. Let's go here. And here you can see the fully qualified domain name. I can copy this fully qualified domain name and try to access this application. Since it is the initial run, it may take some time to load this application in into this container. So this is a public IP.
OK, you can see the application is now running. So this is a very simple static website that is just showing a simple message. So this container containerized application we are starting with this container instances. As you can see in the left side, there is no much configurations available because it's not a uh, very complicated service. It's a very, very simple service. You just need to run a container in the cloud. That's it. The Kubernetes solutions. We have seen how a containerized application can be executed or it can run inside a uh, cloud platform. But we have executed a single container, a static web applic applications container. But what if I have multiple applications or multiple uh, uh, services that we need to containerize and run in the cloud. For example, if I am developing a microservices based application, microservice based application means I have an e-commerce application which I want to deploy inside the cloud environment. So there are multiple services like uh, we have maybe identity service. This is an application. There is, or maybe I can just copy paste. There is a product service. There is a basket service. There may be an order service. Also, there can be a, a payment service. So we have this microservices as part of my e-commerce application. I want to run multiple instances of identity service, multiple instances of product service, multiple instances of basket service and so on. And all these are consumed from a front end UI application. So this is a user interface application. So this will be consuming this backend APIs. See, so this UI application wants to consume these services. But how I can deploy these multiple services together inside a single compute instance? And I want to manage them using a single service. Because uh, maybe I need to go and create multiple instances of my identity service, which means I may need to create two or three instances of the identity service. And then it will be using a load balancer to connect to it. So here. See here, 
this could be a load balancer. See, multiple instances of one service I want to run. But I want to run all them inside the same service. So maybe multiple instances of product service will be there. Multiple instances of basket service will be there. So how I can run these services and how we can manage these services using a single tool or single environment. Such cases, we will go for containerized clustering environment, which means the AKS cluster, which is a, a Kubernetes orchestration service, which helps us to manage this containerized application. So if we have all these applications as containerized, we can run this containerized applications using Kubernetes. So Kubernetes means it's an orchestration service that helps us to deploy multiple containerized applications in a clustered environment. Okay. So what is the benefit of using Kubernetes? Because any containers that is running inside the Kubernetes cluster will be self-healed. Self-healed means if one container fails, it automatically recreates a new container. Or if the container is stopped, it automatically restart. So that will be done by the orchestrator. Dynamic scaling, which means if one container requires or if one service requires multiple instances to be used for handling more number of requests, your uh, Kubernetes is able to create a new instance of that service and add it to the load balancer. So for example here, if I want to add one more instance of identity service. It will be able to create one more instance here and it can be added to the same load balancer. So this will happen automatically. Okay. Rolling updates. It will be easy for us to update new versions of applications within this clustered environments. So if you have multiple instances, each instance will be updated one after another. And some other features which is offered by the AKS, that is enterprise scalability, automatic cluster node and pod scaling. That means uh, AKS is offering the feature called a cluster autoscaler. So cluster autoscaler is used for increasing or adding new nodes to the cluster. And uh, for pod scaling, pod means inside the nodes, inside the cluster, we have multiple nodes and each node runs multiple containers. So this is called a node and these are called the pods. Okay. So for Pod scaling, which means for adding new pods, we will use something called HPA. HPA means horizontal pod autoscaler. So if you want to know more about this, you can go to this and understand how the cluster autoscaling happens. If you look into this picture, you can easily understand the cluster autoscaler is the cluster autoscaler is used for increasing the number of nodes. So suppose there are four nodes and we want to scale out, then it is going to add a new node to the cluster. But HPA, that is horizontal pod autoscaler. It is make sure that you have n number of ports. And if you want to add a new port, it will be adding a new port based on the scaling condition, which means suppose if the 
CPU utilization of your uh, uh, port is more than 70 percentage, I want to scale. So that will be taken care by the HPA, that is horizontal port autoscaler. The node autoscaling will be taken care by the cluster autoscaler. Granular network control, because while creating the AKS cluster, you can specify whether to use the Microsoft provided network or a custom network. If you are using custom network, whether to go for the uh, kubenet ip addressing or the azure cni network uh, networking method which means for the nodes and ports you want to use the same ip range or you want to use different uh, ip ranges you can configure that while creating the cluster cluster node upgrades so you can upgrade the cluster nodes not only the os updates it also updates the kubernetes versions means if a new version of kubernetes is available you can update this kubernetes versions as as well storage volume support i have already mentioned containers cannot persist the data so if you want to persist the data from the containers, you have to use some external storage volumes. It may be an Azure disk or maybe a file share. Ingress with HTTP application routing support. So instead of exposing all the uh, backend APIs or backend uh, microservices or containerized applications, using different different public ips we can connect them using a single ingress endpoint which means here you can see each one of this microservice is exposed publicly so that the app ui application is able to connect to that but if you see if i'm deploying these backend services inside a Kubernetes cluster. See, this is my cluster environment. And instead of exposing each one of this service using public IPs, what I can do, we can use an ingress service. Ingress is just like a load balancer only, but it is, uh, you can say it's a kind of reverse proxy. So here we can use ingress and this ingress is, is connecting to the backend services. And from your external applications, you can connect it using this ingress. So there is only ingress endpoint, which is publicly exposed. You don't need to expose all the services using public IP. Only the ingress public IP is accessible to the user interface. So any request which you are sending, goes through ingress controller and that will forward the request to the backend apis so this can be an nginx ingress controller or azure application gateway ingress controller so the different type of ingress controller supported so you can use nginx or application gateway ingress controller that receive the request from the single endpoint, and then it can forward this uh, request to multiple backend services.
private container registry support. So in our previous example of container instances, I have showed you the Docker Hub. So if you remember, I have used a Docker Hub as my registry, which means I have all my containers stored inside this. Sorry, all my Docker images stored inside my public account. So all these are public. You can see here it's a public. But what if my organization is using some application containers which needs to be accessible only from Azure? Such cases we can use the ACR, which is Azure Container Registry, which is a private registry. And you can deploy your containers using this. Let me just draw a single line. So all the containers can be deployed using this ACR. So you are AKS cluster. So this is your AKS cluster. So your AKS cluster is integrated with ACR, Azure Container Registry, so that these applications, Docker images, can come from this ACR. Design a highly available container solution. So when we deploy uh, Kubernetes clusters, we have to make sure that they are highly available, which means if we have created a AKS cluster in one region, what happens if that region goes down? For example, if I have a container cluster created, a case cluster created in a region uh, Central India. What if the Central India location is down? Maybe some network failure or some natural calamities or because of some reason, we are unable to connect to the Central India location. So your services will get impacted. So to avoid this, we have to make sure that our uh, cluster is created in another region also, maybe in a paired region or in a different region. You will be able to create one uh, additional uh, AKS cluster in a different uh, region so that you will be able to uh, fail over from one to another region. So when planning to implement AKS clusters across multiple region deployments, consider the following, that is region availability. So make sure that uh, you are selecting the regions which is not very close and not very far. Because if you select West India and Central India, that is Mumbai and Pune, so they are very close. Okay, so downtime of one location may affect the other also. But if you select Central India and South India, it's not very far and it is within the same continent, within the same uh, re, uh, geography only, so that it is in a safe distance but not very far. So you have to make sure that you are creating this secondary clusters, not in a very far region. Second, Azure paired regions. It is recommended to use the paired regions like uh, Microsoft Azure already selected some paired regions like uh, for Central India, South India, East US, West US, Southeast Asia, East Asia, like that they already have some Paired regions. Service availability. So whenever you choose a region, make sure that the service, the AKS service is available 
in that region because every region does not offer same set of services. So make sure that your service is available in that particular region. Two ways to synchronize the storage because obviously the applications running in the form of containers we can replicate by uh, or we can recreate by uh, creating clusters in different regions. OK, we can ensure the high availability. But what about the data? So for data, we have to use a asynchronous replication. So infrastructure based asynchronous replication or application based asynchronous replication. So that means from the application whenever you store the data it will go to both the locations and store the data or you can uh, enable geographic rep replication from one database to another database or one storage to another storage without the application So it's not possible for us to go and create the AKS clusters because it's a time consuming process. So I'm not showing the demo of AKS clusters. We are moving to the next compute service that is Azure Functions. The Azure Functions is a way to run the background jobs in a serverless model. So for doing this background jobs, we have already discussed about the web jobs. The web jobs is part of the app service web app. So if you remember. When I was discussing about the. App services, I said there we can execute some background jobs as part of our uh, app service web app. So they are called a web job. So this is the web job which is running within the context of this web app means if the web app is crashed. The web job is automatically crashed. OK, because your web job is running within the context of. Your web app. But. In modern application scenarios, we want to execute some operations in an isolated manner, but they are very short lived backend services. For example, whenever the user register for a particular uh, website, we have to send a registration confirmation mail. Whenever. Whenever the user register for an account, we have to send a verification mail to the user's account. So how we can send the verification mail to the user's account? I can use a Azure function for doing that job. The Azure function is triggered using some kind of events. Maybe an HTTP request is triggering that function because it's a serverless function. Uh, like our container instances, we, we don't need to go and allocate any compute for this also. But whenever some event happens like a a blob is created or a message is added into the queue or an HTTP request is received or even a scheduler can trigger this function. And it can. Execute the task within the given set of time. So this. Is a purely a cloud based solution, so there is no alternate for this in the on premise. So if you see whenever we want to build a new solution, we have to check. Are you looking for a full control? No, because functions are completely past services, so we don't want the full control. 
then are you looking for a high performance compute workload no are you looking for a microservice architecture no are you looking for an event driven workload with a short lived process which means are you planning to execute a background job which will complete within some specific time a short lived function yes such cases we can go for uh, azure functions So the benefit of using Azure function, first of all, the developer is able to go and write the code. So what is the logic? What is the backend service logic we want to implement? The developer can write the code in different uh, languages and frameworks. For example, you can write your function in Python or .NET or Java or PowerShell or even JavaScript also. So the different languages support is available. So you can choose any one language to write the logic. And whenever the uh, trigger is generated, it will execute the function automatically. And it is able to connect to other Azure services without writing much line of code you can use the bindings okay bindings is a way to connect to the azure services so you can use the bindings to connect with other azure services and uh, it is mostly used for modern application development like uh, microservices based applications when you create if i want to execute some kind of background jobs then you will use azure functions and you have to pay only for the executions that means you don't need to pay unnecessarily how much uh, how, ma how many times the function is executing and how long it is executing you will be paying only for that Okay, so you don't need to go and uh, uh, pay for any virtual machines explicitly. How many executions happens? You need to pay only for that. And it automatically scales. So even if hundreds or thousands or millions of executions are required, it automatically scales. Okay, no problem. And this is event driven, which means whenever some event fire it will automatically start executing you don't need to go and manually start this it will automatically get triggered whenever some event occurs i'll show you an architectural diagram where it can be used See, if you look into this diagram, we have multiple microservices. Here is one customer plan service, user management service, and movie service. So here you can see whenever the user registers, means the user service is used for creating a new user account. So whenever a new user account is created, the user details will be stored inside the database. But this microservice can send a message to the service bus queue and the queue can trigger the function. What is this function is doing? The function will be sending a verification mail to the registered user's email ID. So the user needs to go and click on the registry registration verification link which is sent over the mail so they have to click on that link so sending that verification mail can be done using this azure function 
so whenever the user registers it is just add a message to the queue and from the queue it automatically trigger the function similarly another example here in the movies database whenever a new movie is added like it's a like a ott platform so whenever a new movie is released it is send a notification message to the event grid from the event grid the function will trigger that means new movie notification function which will send a push notification to the user's mobile account suppose if you are uh, using amazon uh, uh, prime or hotstar or netflix whenever a new movie is released you will be getting the push notification like a new movie is added or new movie is released so that notification message will be sent by an azure function so in this architecture you can see we have two background jobs sending the verification mail and sending a push notification to mobiles that is done by the azure function let me show you a very simple example of azure function here i'm going to create a function app a function app is a collection of collection of functions so let me select the group as compute group name i can give as bst bst serverless functions and i'm going to write the code in dotnet or javascript or some other language so i am selecting dotnet here dotnet version 6 location east us operating system windows and the plan type is consumption so let this function app creates see here you can see the function app is created and inside this i can go and add a new function so here i can write the code for a new function click on create so i am going to create a simple http based function so here i can select the trigger type as http trigger below i can give a name for this function like a maybe order processor function so this is an order processor function it's creating now
yeah you can see here the function is created and the function code is now loading here it's taking some time okay so here you can see the c sharp code that is receiving the http request and it is just a return a personalized message like a hello with that given name so for testing this i can just copy the url so here is the url and if i go here and uh, paste this along with i can pass the name so name equal to sonu see here it returns a message hello plus that given name the function is triggered successfully but you can modify this code means what is written inside this if you are a developer you can modify this code and returns a message <laughs> returns a http response saying that your order is processed successfully for example if i'm if i'm just uh, simply giving a message like a uh, order processed successfully i'm just putting a dummy message okay it's not going to do any order processing but you can write your code here your code for order processing choose here so you have to write the code here and uh, here i'm just printing a message just saving this just retest this by copying this and making a request here you can see within seconds it is returning order processed successfully right that means this function is executed successfully so here my function is triggered using an http request so whenever i make a http request to this url the function is executed automatically so this is a http trigger based function so like this i can create multiple functions and these functions can be triggered using different types of trigger events here you can see timer trigger you if you want to execute something in a scheduled manner queue storage trigger means if you want to execute something whenever a message is added into the queue so i'll show you an example of that if you want i'm selecting that and uh, giving the name of function is my queue function and here i can give the queue name as maybe uh, orders queue the queue name is orders and it is from which storage account so i can select a storage account so i already have a storage account that is netstar storage so i can select that create but i don't have a queue so i'll go back and create a queue there this is a netstar storage here i can create a queue queue name is orders right now inside this orders queue if i am adding a message automatically this function will trigger see the function code is you can, as a developer if you are a developer you can write the code for that but here it is just reading the queue message and printing that message let us try whether it is executing something or not so i am going to add a message here welcome to azure functions 
I'm going to add a new message to the queue. You can see a message is added to the queue. When I refresh, see it is gone, which means somebody consumed the message. If I go back here, here this function executed. Usually it has to print the log messages here, but if it is not printing here, no worries. You can go to the monitor section. After a few seconds or a few minutes, you will see the execution history here. And you will see the result in the monitor logs. So currently there is no executions collected here. It may take, here you can see it takes up to five minutes to get the monitor data. By the time I'll add one more message like uh, how are you? So this is another message I have added. We need to wait for some time to get this. So usually it has to get this logs directly in the log section. It is slow. Yeah, it may take some time. Okay, it's, you can see here the messages are automatically disappearing because the function is consuming that. Well, I don't know why it is taking up to five minutes to get the data. Oh, here, you can see the first executions. The result is now here. You click. Here you can see the message. Welcome to Azure Functions. This is the first message I have sent, right? So just now it's appearing here. You may get the second one after some time. So anyway, this is how the functions gets triggered. So I have showed two functions. One is triggering using HTTP request and another one is triggering using this uh, Q messages. But understand the Azure functions are uh, stateless. Stateless means they cannot store anything persistently because every time when the request comes or when the trigger fired, it does create a new instance of the function, execute after returning the response, it uh, finish the execution and uh, deallocate it. So that means it does not store any information related to the previous request. OK. So what if I want to execute some tasks which are related? That means if one execution happens, it's a result I want to pass to another function and then continue the execution using another function. For example, I have to execute a function F1. The F1 complete the execution and returns a result. That result we have to pass to the second function. And the second function complete the execution and generates a result, which needs to be passed to F3. That means one function's result need to be passed to another one, which means it, it should be a stateful environment, which means every function's execution result we have to store and then forward it to the 
next one in such cases the normal functions we cannot use because normal functions can execute maximum of 5 minutes so 5 minutes is the maximum time we can execute a function more than 5 minutes if you uh, run the function it will automatically timed out okay but you can up, upgrade it to maximum of 10 minutes so 5 minutes is the default timeout and you can upgrade this to maximum of 10 minutes but that's the reason we are saying uh, execution of long operations means if you want to perform a task which is taking more than 5 minutes then do not use normal functions such cases you can go for durable functions what is durable functions durable function as the name indicates it is durable which means it is storing and persisting the state information for the uh, further executions means the result of one function will be stored and passed to the next functions logic apps and this is the last topic in this module so logic app is another compute service which is used for executing some long running workflows so in the previous topic we have discussed functions are typically used for executing some short lived actions like uh, sending a mail or processing an order or maybe updating the database or maybe converting the word file into pdf so this kind of short lived actions we can execute with the help of functions but what if i have to execute a long running workflow like a, i have to complete an action which it takes 10 minutes or more such cases either i have to go for durable functions durable function is also used for long running workflow because here the functions are divided into small activity functions and one function executes it generates a result which is then passed to the second one second will execute and then pass the result to the third one like that it goes like a chained manner right means it is going to execute a workflow but the problem or the disadvantage of azure functions is we have to write the code you know how the workflow is working but you are not a developer then how you will write or how you implement that workflow i said durable functions is one way to implement the long running workflow you have to write multiple functions for performing the task one you write one function for task two another function for task three another function which means the task one function completes and the result is passed to task two then task two function completes and passed to task three like that you can execute it as a long running workflow but unfortunately if you are not a developer you will not be able to go and uh, uh, execute this or you will not be able to go and write this code so how you will do that you know the logic of the workflow how the workflow is uh, working but you don't know how to write the code for that so no problem as the name indicates the logic app requires only the logic which means you don't need to be a developer logic app which means if you know the logic of the concept or how this is working if you know the logic then you are able to implement that workflow because it is just like a normal uh, flowchart like you will be starting from a trigger and you can write an action which means you can drag and drop some actions pre-created actions which uh, performs the operations like uh, sending the mail or uh, updating the database or uh, uh, converting the 
uh, files from one format to another format like a JSON to XML or XN, XML to JSON conversion or something similar to that. OK, so for executing this kind of long running workflows, you can use logic apps. OK, so as you see in this uh, picture, it's in the in the picture, you, it looks like a flow chart. Like it is start from one point and then you need uh, to uh, uh, execute step by step operations. The logic app is also exactly similar like this, but here it is a decision tree or decision uh, flow that when to go for a logic apps. So here you can see, do you need to in integrate multiple apps or systems? Then yes, then you can go for uh the logic app and you can see uh, do you require near real, real time performance so logic apps problem is it is gets triggered and it may take some time to complete the executions okay so uh, it is not near real time so you have to go for uh, logic app and uh, there another question does your workflow include a very complex conditional business logic so very complicated conditional logic means you have to write the code explicitly but if it is a normal scenario which is which can be achieved through the built-in actions then you can go for logic app so logic app is a good option for sending the email notifications using office 365 when some event ha happens or you want to route and process the customer order across on-premise systems and cloud services. So you have to integrate multiple services together for completing the order processing. Then you can use Logic App. You can move uploaded files from an FTP server to the file storage. Suppose whenever I upload a file to the FTP server, from the FTP server, I want to copy the files or I want to move the files to a Azure blob storage such cases I can use logic app. So means we don't need to write the code for this. There are built in connectors available. So each connector provides some actions and triggers. You have to just uh, configure the parameters. That's it. Monitor tweets, analyze the sentiment and create alerts or task for items that it need to review means for uh, Facebook post management or your uh, Twitter tweets or sending emails through Gmail or Outlook, you can use the logic app because it provides built in connectors for your uh, logic apps. So if you compare the logic apps with functions, you can see some difference because both are triggered. So when some trigger execute, then the logic app start executing and the function start executing. So if you compare them, you can see both have some similarities as well as some differences. Similarity means both are triggered and then executed. Both are serverless. But the differences, if you see, for functions, you have to write the code, which means you must be a developer who knows a particular programming language because everything you will be implementing using the code. But in uh, Logic App, it is something uh, GUI based, which means designer based. You can just uh, drag and drop the controls and actions, then you will be able to create the workflow. If you see the method, uh, create orchestrations by using the GUI or editing configuration files. In logic apps, as I have mentioned, there is a GUI graphical user interface. You can drag and drop the items or you can edit the JSON configuration file just to update that. But for durable functions, 
which is also used for executing workflows, you have to write the code for uh, executing this durable functions. Means you must be a developer. Then only you will be able to write it. Connectivity, if you check, your logic app provides more connect connectors which allow you to connect to Azure services as well as the third party services like uh, connecting to Gmail, connecting to Outlook, connecting to uh, Facebook, connecting to uh, OneDrive, connecting to Dropbox, connecting to FTP server, connecting to SQL server, connecting to uh, different other servers, even tw Twitter. Every connector is available in Logic App. If you want, you can create your custom connectors also. But durable function, very less number of bindings available. The connectors in functions called bindings. So only selected Azure services are able to connect to logic apps like a storage account, uh, blob services, queue services, even grid services, send grid services, even hub. So such services you can use to trigger the durable functions means you can have integration with these services it means the number of services that you can connect is very less for example if i want to connect facebook from a function it is very difficult because there is no built in connector available but connecting facebook from logic app is very easy because there is a built in connector available monitoring so how many executions happened and uh, you want to see the log informations, you can use Azure portal and uh, monitor logs for logic apps and uh, for durable functions, Azure application insights, which is a monitoring service for uh, app services and uh, functions. So that's it in this module. In this module, we have discussed different uh, compute services like uh, virtual machines, then uh, app services, functions, container instances, uh, AKS, and uh, finally, the logic apps. Now, uh, I think it's almost, uh, I think the session is still four o'clock. So we have to explain, or I have to explain something about your uh, further studies. So I have covered this day one's topics here, that is the governance and compute, and uh, the rest of the topics you can learn from the Microsoft Learn, or you can go for an instructor led training that is for four days. There you will be covering everything in detail and uh, with the hands on. If you want to learn these modules, the remaining modules, you can use this uh, links that the Microsoft Learn link for AZ305. This is one link that I can share with you. So here I have shared the link of AZ305. If you see here, you will see different course modules for this is what we have discussed in the first module, like, uh, sorry, not this one. Okay, design infrastructure solutions. OK, so this all these are part of the uh, AZ305.
This is the governance strategy. Okay, so if you want to know more about this uh, AZ305 certification uh, and its modules, please connect with us. And here, some other links that is pointing to the Azure documentation. That also I can share. So when you go for the exam, means if you are looking for the AZ305 exam, you can see some of the exam prep videos uh, from this uh, website itself. And you can also download the AZ305 study guide, which helps you to uh, understand which of the topics you have to cover. And there is also an exam sandbox, which help you to understand what kind of question models will come. So I'll show you. So if you go to the AZ305 certifications page, here you will see the exam prep videos where you can see some of the videos. This is, uh, I think, uh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes videos each that is talking about some of the services. And here you can see the links. Here you can see the links for the other videos as well. So below there are four videos you can see and some of the uh, topics they are covering in this videos. And here is a study guide which you can download, which uh, give you an update about what changes they have made, what are the different modules covered in each area. So here, identity, governance, and monitoring, 25 to 30 percentage. So which of the modules co comes under that? So 30 percent of the questions may come from this area. So storage solutions, another 30 percent of the questions may come from this area. Okay. So you will come to know about the coverage, course coverage, and the links, okay, and some of the uh, FAQs and the questions related to the learning materials, all you can see here. Okay. So this is what the study guide. And here is the exam sandbox. This is going to help you understanding about the question patterns. Okay, so I think. So once you start the exam, you will be getting a window like this where you will see the timer in the top right. First of all, you have to read and accept the terms and conditions and go to next. And in this page, it will show what, which exam you are attending and how many questions there in the uh, exam and how many case studies because some of the questions are based on case study. And what will be the duration of the exam? Like if it is two hours, three hours, 180 minutes or uh, 140 minutes, whatever is the duration. And what is the passing score? For most of the exam, it's 700 only. Out of 1000, you have to score 700. So in this page, you will come to know how many questions you have and how many case studies. Click on next. Here you have to read about the exams, means what are the things you have to do, what, what will comes in the screens, all you can read from here. Just follow 
next here you will be starting this exam so once here it will show the timer as well as the number of questions when you click on this start exam in the top right it will show the timer what is the time remaining and uh, how many questions you have already answered and uh, how many questions remaining that you will show here so this is the first question you can see here you can read this question this is a dummy question only so here you can read the question and this is a multiple choice uh, mcq so here we have multiple choice you have to go and answer or you have to select a single answer from this so here you can see this type of this is a type of uh, this question type is known as multiple choice select one this question type contains multiple answer choices and has correct answer there are several varieties of question types and there is something something they have given so what is your favorite sound we can choose only one option from here for example if i say bird then you can here is an option you can see review later and the leave feedback which means the review later means after answering all these questions you will be able to come back to this by clicking on this review okay, if you click and you, you you are marking this question for review maybe after getting after completing the other questions you can come back to this and review okay leave feedback means suppose if you feel that this answer uh, answers are uh, confusing or this may be a wrong question or the question format is not satisfiable so some comment if you want to provide that you can mark for the feedback so after after answering all the questions you can provide this feedback okay and you can also see here the calculator okay and uh, color scheme if you want to change some maybe if you have some vision problems you can change the color scheme so you can pause and take a break maybe if you want to drink water or something you can pause it and take a break okay return to exam next here you can come here this is the second question and it shows the progress here and this is multiple choice but multiple select which means you need to select multiple answers so in the question itself they will mention how many uh, answers you have to select so here the question is which two fruits make a great snack so if you uh, feel that okay grapes and maybe apple if you like that too you can select and click on next so this uh, is little confusing so what i have to do i have to review it later so i mark it for review and this type of question is uh, for drag and drop so if you see you have to drag the item from the left to the right side so here the question is which of the following pieces of furniture should you keep in office or home this is a sample dummy question only suppose uh, for home okay here you can see lamp lamp i'm just putting this here sofa is uh, here home table is office table i can just put bookshelf at home ping pong table again i'll make it this chess set at home and this and finally here so you can drag and drop the answers from left to the right side you can expand this window size like this also okay so that is possible <clears throat> so this is one type of question drag and drop question so you can drag this back also that is suppose if this answer is wrong suppose you have already answered like this so you can move this here or maybe you want to replace you can just put this on top of this so it will replace okay or you can directly put this
Now here, this is the next type of question, which means uh, building list. So you have to put the answers in the correct order. Maybe uh, there are some steps like uh, how to make a pizza. So what are the different steps in gold? So you have to drag and drop the, the steps like uh, maybe in your uh, system. So how you troubleshoot a problem? So the steps you have to mention in the correct order so that you have to drag and drop in the correct order. For example, uh, so how many here they, they may be telling, OK, which five tasks you have to put in the correct order? So five items only you have to drag and drop. Place a slice of bread on top of the ham and. Condiments, so that will be the last option, I think. OK, so this will be the first one. Place the slice of bread on the plate. Uh, yes, OK, this may be. I think uh, add mayo. Add onions. And please. Um, and then finally this step. OK, so I'm just adding this. So don't place everything in the right side because in the question they have clearly mentioned which five tasks. So sometimes it may be all steps. Sometimes it may be only selected numbers. So sometimes they say, OK, uh, five out of five. So in left side there will be only five. So all the five you have to place in the correct order. Sometimes they will give eight or ten from out of that you have to select a number of task to the right side that you have to read very carefully and then answer. Next. Here you can see this is uh, there is a screen in the screen you have you will get some answer. So here you will see a company is upgrading. It's a client computers from Windows XP to Windows 7. You add an application to Windows 7 base image. The menu on the title bar of the application is not displayed properly. Although the other graphic elements are displayed correctly, you need to ensure that the application's menu is displayed correctly on the client computers that runs Windows 7. Which op option you should choose to activate the goal? To answer, select the appropriate settings in the window. OK, so that means this is the window. Here, if you see, this is the picture. This is going to be a checkbox. This is going to be a drop down. So you have to select here, like a, a run this program in compatibility mode of Windows 7. OK, and what are the other options you have to select? Maybe color scheme I have to set. OK, some maybe disable visual themes. So that you, you, you should know what is the correct options you have to select. So. This is also a kind of question type, but in our 305, I don't see uh, this kind of UI, but maybe in uh, uh, in your uh, Azure portal, some of the settings you have to go and select like this. OK, so you may get a question something like this also. That is what you have to choose. So these are the different options you have to choose. This is. Another type of question from here. You will uh, go and read this scenario and you have to. So for satisfying this, what are the different answers you have to select from here? So here create a user role. So here inside your machine, you th they are giving the server name and the configuration settings. And they are saying, OK, you need to implement a self-service provisioning for the virtual machines. The solution must ensure the users to, can start the virtual machine. Create virtual machine templates and create services. So for creating a user role, you have to use which one? So server 1, server 2, server 3 or server 4. The user role, maybe I don't know about this. Maybe operations manager, so I can select this. Actions assigned to the user role. So they should be able to start the VMs, create the VMs, 
VM templates and create services. So start checkpoints. Okay, maybe this one. I am not sure. So anyway, you have to. So these are dummy questions. So just you have to go and select the answers from the drop down according to this question. Next, another question type that may come is like this: the hot area uh, kind of questions. So here they will be giving the uh, scenario. That is your you administer a computer that has Windows 7 Enterprise. The computer has an application that must run by administrative permissions. The user who has a standard user account connects to the computer by using the re remote desktop connection. The user right click the application shortcut, but run as administrator option is unavailable. You need to ensure that the user is able to run the application by the admin privileges. Which service should you configure? So here, these things you have to select. So this is something similar to the previous one only, but here you have to go and choose the appropriate options. Which service you should select? Hmm. I don't know. So anyway, that app, uh, option you have to select here. Here, this is uh, some case study based one. So here you will see the question and the overview and some of the extra panels where they will give the uh, requirements scenarios and other things so here overview is the counter so is uh, that don't click on the next and previous you can directly click on this panels only okay so unfortunately if you click next 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 and finish then you will not be able to answer the questions so related to this there may be two or three questions so here this is the eighth question, maybe eight, nine, ten questions may be related to the same case study. If you see this uh, overview, you have to read first. So Condoso is has 3000 users and data center at Toronto, 20 offices across Canada and so and so. And their existing environment. So they will be talking about some scenarios. You have to study this in detail because their the questions are related to this configurations. So you can see this and this is what the requirement. So this is the existing scenario. And this is what they have want to achieve. So read all these things and you can go back to the questions and then answer this. So based on this scenario, what option you have to select? So they have given a question. So suppose if this is the answer, you can select click on next. So here you can see it is it is giving only one question based on this, but in a real scenario, there there may be two or three questions or maybe up to five questions that can come from the case study. So this is a case study from related to this. There can be five questions. So this panel remains same in the left side. Whenever you click on next, it will change the question here. You can click on the question section. And answer it. And whenever you want to read the question back, means uh, read the things back, you have to click on the overview or this panels again and click back on the question. This is another one. This is exhibit. So they are giving some question and some pictures later to that. So you by looking into this, you have to answer this. And multiple pictures will be there sometimes. So for answering this, you have to go through each one of this picture and then answer this. So 
so in in azure certifications there may be three questions and uh, maybe two of them may be yes and one is false uh, no or maybe two answers will be no and one is yes or maybe all of them will be yes or all of them will be no so that you have to read and mostly three questions will come here you can see only two so sometimes three questions may come so after this you will get the uh, total number of questions answered here for review you have given two for command you have given one so if you click on this these are the review questions you can go back to this okay and if you don't want to review it then you can go to next and uh, for comment this is the one which you have you want to apply some comments this one once you finish the exam you have to confirm whether you are you have answered all the questions click on yes and then here it will show you the score how much you have scored and whether you have passed the exam or not so here it is not showing anything but in the real scenario it will be showing the total score you have and uh, you have completed the exam whether you have passed or not that will be appeared here so this is the question patterns and also you will you will be able to take some practice test here so here you can see some option for practice test if you click on this some of the sample questions you can see here okay if you read this like this may be a question so virtual machine should use a snapshot here so if this go to next and this is the second question you can see up to 50 questions they have given so read these questions and answer them i'm just randomly selecting this so you need to design a high highly available this is the real question for az305 so you need to design a highly available solution for uh, sql database solution must meet the requirements minimize cost provide high availability for the storage and provide high availability for the processing tier so you can go for what type of uh, storage tier so here this question is also again about the high availability okay so you have to read and answer yes So you need to ensure that the solution is available. If a data center within the region fails, the solution must. So within a region, they are saying so it will be availability zone. Okay, so that you have to answer. So there are 50 questions. You can answer them one by one and we can also verify. So if I'm selecting, you'll be able to understand what is the answer for that. Okay. And the description also they have given here. So you, you can verify yourself whether the answer is correct or not based on this. So that for that you have to go for the practice test so here is the practice test option and then you can schedule the exam once you sh schedule the exam you need to go to fill your personal details i have already completed so it may not come for me So here we have discounts available because we are MCTs. We have special discount. And if you are 
if you are planning to schedule the exam, you can click on schedule with Pearson view. And here you will get a calendar. OK. See, I have already scheduled this exam. I have already completed. That's why I'm not able to do this. Otherwise, it will open or it will take you to the Pearson view website and there you will be able to select to the date and time for the exam. So that's it for this particular session. This is a one day session just to give an awareness about the AZ305. So where we could cover the two modules in detail. And there are some other nine modules remaining. Which uh, you can prepare. From the Microsoft Learn or you can opt for a instructor led training. OK, uh, Chaitali, are you there? Chaitali is not there. I am attending today. Neeta Shivastav. OK, so Neeta, I have uh, done with the session. I think we have time till 4 o'clock, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I have done with the session. So if they don't have any other questions, then uh, we are good to wind up the session. Guys, request you to share your valuable feedback on the given feedback form link. If you have any question, you can put the question here also for time being. 